Hi, everyone. I'm Jason O'Dell, and thanks for joining my webinar today. Um, I'm happy to be here, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, infrared photography today. It's something that I enjoy, and over the winter, you can uh, learn how to do this. Um, it's much better for the for the summer months. It's good to see everybody out there. I see a lot of familiar names. And um, like I said, this is being recorded. So um, I'll take your questions at the end of my little presentation here, and it should be fun. So let's go and jump into um, my presentation slides. And this is sort of my introduction to di uh, digital infrared photography. And um, again, I'm Jason O'Dell, and my website is right down there, luminescentphoto.com. What I'm going to talk about today, a um, couple of things, it's just this is for uh, an introduction to infrared photography. So if you've never, you know, really got understanding of what what it means to do infrared photography, that's what I'm going to be talking about today, sort of the fundamental concepts of what it is that we're trying to do and why we do it. And I'll provide some inspiration with examples from the field. I'll, I'll briefly talk about my processing um, uh, for how to process infrared images. This is not a processing class. I can offer that separately if people are interested, but for the most part, I wanna talk about um, just the general um, idea of what goes into infrared photography. So let's start with that. Okay, I wanna talk about the difference between infrared light and visible light. And I wanna talk about uh, then infrared as being a creative tool. Uh, when you can, when's a good time to shoot an infrared, and how to capture infrared images with your with your camera. Okay, so here is my high school physics chart of the electromagnetic spectrum, and the electromagnetic spectrum is all energy waves. It goes from everything from being super short cosmic rays to really long, like broadcast, television, radio, that kind of stuff. And in between, smack down in the middle, is this tiny little band of visible light. And that ranges between, we, we measure this in, in uh, the wavelength is measured in, in a unit called nanometers, which are really tiny, tiny fractional meters. Okay, so down here at 400 nanometers, we've got the the violet part of the spectrum into blue. And up here at 700 nanometers, you get into red. And if you just go beyond that part of the visible spectrum, we're now talking about invisible spectrum, you get infrared. More importantly, we get the near infrared. Um, you go a little bit farther out, you start getting into heat, but we're not, we're not worrying about heat. We're not talking about incandescent stuff. We're talking about just the, the part of the, the invisible spectrum that lies just beyond the reds. So we're talking about 720, 780, 800 nanometers right around in here. That's infrared. So yeah, we live there and um, infrared is very cool. And the reason why it's very cool is because it allows you to do some particularly creative things with your photography. Um, obviously, the look is unique. You cannot capture this look um, without an infrared camera. There's people who've tried to replicate it with post-processing, it's not quite the same, okay? Uh, you need a real infrared um, camera to do this. It makes skies more dramatic. It penetrates haze. Uh, last week when I was talking about what would Ansel do to Ansel Adams, he actually has sections on infrared photography. He didn't give a lot of, um, uh, he didn't give it a lot of space in his book, but he did mention how it dramatically cuts back on on haze in distant landscapes. Um, but the other signature of infrared photography is how foliage gets rendered really bright. Uh, in, and depending on how you captured it, it's often bright white looking, okay? Um, and so you'll see this in monochrome, or it can have a little bit of color in it, depending on the camera that you're using. But you'll get these glowing highlights sometimes, um, and you can get great highlight detail. If you do portraits with infrared, um, it can make skin tones really, really smooth, okay? And it's because infrared isn't reflecting from the surface of your skin. It's reflecting from about a millimeter below the surface of your skin. So those little fine lines, wrinkles, uh, freckles can, can disappear 
if you photograph someone with an infrared camera. It's pretty cool. So when should you consider shooting infrared? When is the best time? Well, you can shoot at any time, but I like to think that the best times to shoot infrared are sort of the you know, morning, middle of the day when you've got bright sun, white clouds. That's when most people shoot. Um, but also you can shoot any time with infrared. Storms are cool. Uh, fog is cool. Um, you know, anytime you get directional light, that's going to be a good time to shoot infrared. Where I generally skip the infrared is at night or blue hour. Although I know people who do infrared night photography. It is, it is certainly, certainly possible. The thing, the time that I like to shoot infrared though is more of the time of year, and that's spring into summer and fall, because I like to shoot infrared when there are leaves on the trees. So when things are growing and there's foliage, you get shots like this, which was, I captured that in uh, Chicago um, many years ago, um, where you've got a window box, you can see the clouds reflected there in the, the sky in the window, and then the foliage gets rendered this, this lovely um, pastel, in this case, kind of bluish image the way I processed it. Now, I learned this from, I got to give credit where credit is due. I learned this from my colleague, Tony Sweet. Um, when things get wet, they get dark in infrared, and that can create some very cool contrast. So wood, metal, wet leaves, um, water can look dark, although it's interesting that infrared can sometimes penetrate, um, you know, a pond you can see um, reflecting um, like uh, l water lily uh, stems underneath the water. Um, and Tony's pro tip was to carry a squirt gun with you, you know, bring the super soaker. And uh, wet things down a little bit if you if you need to, if you're in a particularly dry area. Now, I haven't tried that in the field personally, but that is a good tip. The whole point of this is to experiment. Uh, infrared photography is kind of experimental just by itself. And then you need to experiment with it to see what kind of results you get and what what things you like to do. So... Assuming you want to go into this, how do you how do you shoot infrared? You know, what do you do it? How do you record the infrared images? Well, there's two ways to do it, um, and I'm not talking about infrared film. That's the third way to do it. But I'm going to talk about digital. And the two ways to do it would be to either use a filter that's blocks visible light. It's an infrared filter like a Hoya R72, or and that would go onto the lens, or you could have your digital camera converted to be sensitive to infrared. So I'll talk about both of these. If you use an infrared filter, they're going to block the visible light and they allow the infrared wavelengths to pass through. Uh, there's two problems with this. And, and the first problem is that in digital cameras, there's an infrared blocking filter on the sensor itself. It's called the IR cut filter. Okay. And that means not a lot of infrared uh, wavelength is going to hit your sensor on an unconverted camera. And that means you're going to be getting very long exposures. Um, you're going to have to shoot at very high ISOs. Now, that's maybe that's a look that you like. It's certainly this is the cheapest way to do it because all you got to do is buy an infrared filter. Um, but the other thing that's a real pain is that once you put this infrared uh, filter, it blocks visible light. And that means on a regular DSLR, for example, you can't see through the viewfinder. Now, with a mirrorless camera, this you can you can kind of you know get better results because you're getting an electronic viewfinder. But with a regular DSLR, you would be in a really tough uh, tough spot. On the other hand, what most of us who are serious about, or at least semi serious about infrared um, photography, do is we convert our cameras. We send it off to a company to get it converted. And what they do when you send it to them, it's a few hundred dollars, depending on the kind of camera, is that they're going to replace your optical low-pass filter, that glass uh, filter that's on top of the sensor. They're going to remove that and replace it with one that allows infrared to go through and block the visible light. Okay, so that's that's basically a, a complete conversion. And now what you get back is a camera that only sees in infrared. But the cool thing about this is that if it's a DSLR, you're just looking through the viewfinder, nothing has changed because all the, all the hard work was done at the sensor level. 
And if you're using live view or a mirrorless camera, you're going to see not only what the camera sees, but you're going to see it in infrared too. You're going to see an infrared represent, um, representation. And that's really cool. And then you'll get, for the most part, relatively normal shutter speeds, just like your visible light or color camera. Okay. Depending on the wavelength, there's going to be a little less light coming through. So at the higher wavelengths you go, you might have slightly slower shutter speeds. But for the most part, you can shoot this handheld normally. Okay. Unlike a five minute long exposure with an unconverted camera and a filter. So what it comes down to is how to choose a camera. If you're going to commit to this, um, you got to send your camera in. You're going to spend 300 maybe $350, whatever it costs, depending on the company. What do you do? Um, well, first, you got to choose the right camera. Um, you should consider things like mirrorless cameras. Uh, they have some significant advantages. First one I've already mentioned was you're, you're getting a preview of the, the image in your, in your viewfinder. But they also focus using the sensor. And with infrared light, if you, if you were around a really long time ago, some old manual focus camera lenses would have a separate set of focus engraving markings on them. And those were the infrared focus. Infrared light focuses in a different plane than visible light. The lenses we use are designed for visible light. They bend that light. They refract that light. They bend that infrared light too, but not in the same degree. So focusing can be a problem with DSLRs. You should consider what lenses work for infrared because some lenses might be great for your color camera and produce awful images with infrared. Um, including things like smeared edges or bright hot spots or color shifts that can be really, really painful. And then I like to always f factor in, is this your primary camera or a secondary camera? And if it's a secondary camera, you might not want to convert a giant pro grip DSLR that you have to carry around extra as something that's secondary. So I like small mirrorless cameras work very well for, for infrared. Now, the thing is that you can convert pretty much any digital camera to infrared, including those little compact point and shoots. And there was a time when people would get those Canon G series cameras, like a G9 or G11, whatever they are now, I don't even know. You could convert it to infrared, very easy to do. And it was good enough and uh, you could have fun with it and nice and compact size. The other thing you have to think about, and this is where we get messy now, is which conversion do you choose? Because you're going to have all these choices when you go to the website that says, oh, you can choose, you know, you know, they either give it a name like standard infrared or they or they uh, give it the wavelength that, you know, 720 or 590. What does this mean? OK, well, typically what you're going to see is what you're going to get out of your camera will depend on the cutoff wavelength. So how far up into the infrared does the camera start blocking the visible spectrum? So way up at the top, 780 nanometers to 810, 830, you're just going to get monochrome images. Now, they'll look weird when you get them in your camera, but they're just basically images that you convert to black and white. There's no color separation whatsoever in your file. As you move down to the standard conversion, what's called standard infrared or 720 nanometers, this is your all-purpose conversion. This is the traditional infrared. You'll get the white foliage. Um, depending on the lens, you'll get a little bit of color. And depending how you process that, you can get that blue sky look if you've been familiar with that. Um, but this is traditional. You can make them black and white. You can go a little bit with color. And then as we go down from here, remember that spectrum that I showed you. As we go down the line, we start getting more into the visible part of the spectrum. Because if you recall, 700 was about the cutoff for visible. That was red. So we get 665, and we're getting a little more color. And this is this is good for, for images where you want that blue sky look, um, but you still want to have bright white foliage where, or, or you know with, with some color in it. We go down from there, you get into something that's called that, that's 590, sometimes called super color. This is where we're now getting middle toned foliage that has color in it, that cyan kind of look. Um, so it's got a lot of color and the infrared style is a little bit more muted because we're letting in so much more of the visible spectrum. 
Now, when you the more color you let into your image, the more post-processing you have to do. So if you're not good at post-processing, 720 to, to 780, somewhere in there, to go with just black and white conversion is your easiest option. You want to start messing with color infrared, you're really going to need to know how to use your image editing software. Now, there is an, a unique filter that's made by um, Kalari, Kalari Vision. It's called IR Chrome, and that creates a very wild look. It looks a lot like the old Kodak, Kodak Aerochrome film, where foliage is red and skies kind of look bluish, maybe a little cyan. And I'm going to show some examples of this, okay? But first, let me make a quick note on infrared conversions and filters. Remember how infrared on my little chart was going higher. The longer the wavelengths, the more we got into infrared. So if you have an infrared conversion on a camera that's say 590 or 720, you can put a, a 830 filter on that camera and block those lower wavelengths. These are, these are high pass filters essentially, but you can't do it the other way around. So if you get your camera converted to 830, let's say, there's nothing you can do to get 590. Okay, so you can have a lower wavelength conversion and then use a lens filter in combination to change up the looks that you get out of your one camera. The, the, the really hip thing lately, the cool thing, is, is something called a full spectrum conversion. This is where they literally just remove the filter from your sensor altogether and you allow it to be sensitive to both visible and infrared light. Now, if you use this without a filter, you get really ugly looking photos. You get color photos that look contaminated with infrared. It's not a look that I that I like. It's not, it's not really good visible. It's not good infrared. It's, it's neither, it's just meh. So every shot requires a filter. So you can use infrared filters for infrared, and you can choose the different wavelengths, whichever one you want, because the filter has been completely removed from your sensor. So you could use 590, 720, 665, whatever. You could also then use a hot mirror or IR cut filter, and then you have a visible camera. So you can use one camera for both types of shooting. Some cameras will support these clip-in rear filters for mirrorless cameras. You can't do this with DSLRs because there's a mirror in the way. And this is where the filter just clips in with a magnet into your lens mount. So it's in front of the sensor, behind the lens. What's nice about that is then you can use any lens for the most part with that, with that conversion. You don't have to have different size filter threads for different front filters. Um, on the other hand, you got to, they're kind of a, you, you have to fuss with them to, you know, pop them out. I don't recommend changing them while standing up in the field. You're going to get dust in your in your camera. So let's compare these conversions, okay? So starting on the upper left, we get 780. You get pretty much black and white. It's not going to look like that coming out of the camera. It's going to look probably just meh. But you convert it to black and white, and that's what you get. Very strong foliage, white leaves, white grass, dark black skies. So we go down to 720. Below that, you can see there's a little bit of color seeping into that sky. That sky looks a little bit orange, okay? And as we go down, 665, there's more color. 590, now the leaves aren't white anymore. They're more cyan. And by 550, you get purple leaves. This is kind of a wild conversion, but it's not one that I've, that I've personally used. And then there's that IR chrome filter, which gives you essentially blue skies and red foliage. It's pretty wild. All you have to do is set the white balance and that's what you'll get. Now, one thing you can do, it's a, it's a trick that we've learned in post-processing is something called the channel swap. And the channel swap is where you reverse the red and blue channels, usually traditionally using the channel mixer tool in Photoshop. And if you swap them, this is what you'll get, more or less. So you can see 665, you're getting a blue sky, very strong white foliage. 550 is that weird one again. 590, you get yellow or golden foliage with a blue sky, 
Again, this is with proper white balancing, not out of the camera. 720 is kind of in between. There's a mild blue sky, but you still get the white foliage. So if you're a fan of this look, it can kind of direct your, you know, direct you towards the conversion that you might want to get. Uh, you don't swap 780 and you don't swap IR Chrome, so those are NA on these. So there are some significant benefits of a full spectrum mirrorless camera if you're into infrared photography. You can use it for any infrared wavelength. All you need to do is get the right filter, okay, either on your lens or if available, the, the rear filters. And then you can use it as a visible light camera too. So if you're on a trip and you just want to bring one camera or it's a backup, it's a potential backup camera, you just put the hot mirror filter in there if you're traveling. It, it, it has a, some compelling um, reasons why, why it's nice. But again, without a filter, full spectrum cameras are kind of useless. They're just not, not very good. So let's talk about now, I want to move on to some of the challenges with infrared capture, okay? First, I've already mentioned focusing, okay? Infrared light doesn't focus in the same plane as visible light, and your lenses are not designed for infrared. The manufacturers, they're just not making lenses for infrared photography, okay? So uh, we can run into some problems here. Um, now, if you use a DSLR, those focusing sensors behind that mirror or in the bottom of your mirror box are designed and calibrated for the visible light. So you can get a you can get your focus calibrated. Um, sometimes people will just say stop the lens down. But the best option is to just put your camera into live view and use that for focusing because then the mirror is up and the sensor is being used to focus your your lens. Okay. Another challenge is setting the white balance. Now this is with raw images, but also with the cameras. Infrared images are weird. They don't have the same color balance because there's really not real color coming in. So what the camera records, it has no idea how to set a white balance. That means if you're going to shoot something like JPEGs, you would need an in-camera white balance setting that was more or less accurate. Um, for some wavelengths, you can do that. And for some cameras, you can do that. For example, um, I can set a custom white balance in my Nikon camera for um, um, for some wavelengths, but not for others. So if I use 590, I can do a custom white balance, but if I do 720, it just fails. Or the other way around, I can't remember. The other problem is, is now when you if you shoot in RAW and you bring this RAW file in, you've got to set the white balance somehow because otherwise the images look just Pink, okay, they're they're going to be ugly when you just get them in natively. Um, sometimes the native camera conversion software that comes with with your camera can can read an in camera. But again, if the in camera white balance wasn't able to be set correctly, it's not going to matter. So depending on your software, uh, you might have to make some tweaks to get the white balance properly set. And this has always been a challenge. Now, if you don't want to do that, again, your backup strategy is convert to black and white. That is the, the take-home message. The other challenges have to do with lenses, okay? One challenge that has been around forever, and it's not getting any better these days, are hotspots. A hotspot is a bright flare almost. It's not a lens flare, but it's just a bright area, usually in the center of your image. And depending on the severity of it, it can be... Uh, you can sometimes mitigate them in post a little bit, or they can be almost impossible to remove, especially if you're, you know, covering a complex scene. Um, that's a problem, and it's a it's a it's a function of the lens, the lens coatings, and the way it's designed. The only thing you can do to avoid hot spots is to use lenses that don't produce them, and that's there's a list of those, um, at least for Nikon lenses, on my uh, website. Now. Um, the other thing you can do to try to mitigate hot spots is shoot with the lens not stopped down. So shoot wide open. They tend to get worse as you stop down. So if you have a lens and you test it, you say, well, it's pretty good between, you know, from wide open to say F5.6 and then at F8, you might start seeing a hot spot. So you just have to know in the field 
don't take this lens past say 5.6 or or wherever wide angle lenses especially the mirrored mirrorless lenses this is another unfortunate thing um, are notorious for producing soft mushy corners and again this is because the the sharp corners in these wide angle lenses the a lot of the work for the refractive properties of the lens are being handled by optical coatings not by the glass as much so the glass does some of the work and then the coatings do a lot of the work too well those coatings are not designed for infrared photography in mind so you can end up with lenses that are wonderfully good in visible light and just god awful horrible mushy in um infrared so you just have to be aware of those things and, and try to do some research before you jump into to using lenses that might not be good for infrared because you'll just be upset with with your results if you use um problem lenses this is my current infrared setup which is a nikon z6 full spectrum conversion and a set of kalari magnet clip-in filters so i have 720 590 i have their ir chrome filter and i have their hot mirror what they call the pro 2 filter um, I don't know why they, they it's the second generation. It's the one that works better. And then my two main lenses are the Nikon 28 to 75 F2.8. It's a very good lens for infrared. It's one of the best ones that I've tested. And then I will sometimes use the 14 to 30 F4, which is also pretty good. Um, but again, it, you can run into some soft corners on the on the widest settings. But it but it's pretty good, and it doesn't produce terrible hot spots or anything like that. So those two are are the the my current choices for that. Okay, enough technical stuff. Let's look at some pictures. Okay, um, right here in Colorado, this is one of the earliest infrared shots I I ever made, out where the sunflowers grow in the summertime. Um, I, I used a Nikon 1V1 camera to capture this. This was probably back in 2014. First, first infrared camera I ever had converted. This is up in the mountains, this cool town called Guffey. And uh, you go up there and it's wild. And they got old cars and, and antiques and things lying around. And this, this was converted to infrared <clears throat> um, from, I believe, uh, 590. Here are some water lilies at the denver botanical gardens and what you can notice is that you can see the stems going down under the water and during the daytime it's really hard to see those but the infrared penetrates the water and you notice how the water looks really black part of that is the way i processed it but water makes infrared uh it makes dark images on infrared this was out in the town of Lyman, out off east of uh, East I seventy. Um, it's it's a, a five ninety nanometer image. Here's another place up in the mountains here in Colorado. This one I did a uh, channel swap, so I've got that dark blue sky, and I processed it so that the grass and the trees look white. Another shot from up in the mountains, converted to monochrome. You can see how the sky gets a lot of contrast. This was 720, I believe. Um, but the um, those black Ansel Adams skies are really easy to get with um, infrared cameras. You can even use a polarizer on top of it if you wanted to. Shots from the desert southwest out in, in the uh, Tucson, Arizona area, saguaro cactuses. This was, um, I believe, 720. Just out of the camera this is also near tucson we took our workshop group here this is in tucson i like this image just because it's minimal and the thing i should point out about this photo is this is the true about any infrared photo it doesn't matter whether you shoot visible black and white monochrome whatever color infrared you still have to have composition and an interesting subject I see so many images where it's like, I shot this in infrared. And it's like, well, okay, but it's not a very strong composition. Or it's not a very compelling shot. So just because it's infrared doesn't make your photo any better. It just makes it different. This is with that IR chrome filter in, um, in downtown Tucson. The palm trees are always a good subject there too. 
I've taken my infrared camera overseas sometimes with my traveling and my overseas photo tours. This was uh, in the um, Kuchenhof Gardens in in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, the, all the daffodils were were blooming. That's a little old mini out there. I thought this was cool. This was in Ireland. Some of you out there might have been on this trip with me. And this was in um, Scotland, I believe. So infrared cameras in Ireland and Scotland and places like that where you've got old stone churches and lots of green grass. Magical. This is an overcast day. Didn't matter. It was just fine. You can see I got a little texture in the sky there even. This was in Belize at a uh, the Mayan temple of Lamanai. And we didn't have much time there, but I had my infrared camera and we were there middle of the day. Middle of the day is really not great for visible light photography. You know that it's not, not the most flattering light, but it was great for infrared. And I'm glad I brought my, my camera on that trip. I love going to New York city. I love doing photo walks there at infrared central park is just magical for infrared photography. This was in the summer of 2018. When I shot this, that's a very photographed bridge. I mentioned skin tones. I ran into this, um, this in individual here and uh i asked if i could take her photo now i want to point out a couple of things about this this picture now she was 20 something so she's probably got pretty good skin anyway but you can see how her skin is just rendered very smooth <laughs> but the other thing about her she's got a tattoo and the tattoo really pops out because remember i mentioned that the that the infrared light is reflecting from a little bit below the surface of that skin so the tattoos really pop and then the other thing that you probably don't realize is that she's wearing dark, opaque sunglasses. And yet the infrared light went right through those sunglasses. So depending on the, the type of sunglasses that you're wearing, you might go right through. She was wearing dark glasses. This was cool. And then I think she had um, dyed her hair or something like that. So you get that, that wild blue hair effect. Anyway, this was cool. We were in front of the Flatiron building. Um, and I'm hoping to go back to New York soon for more infrared photography. Also in uh, Central Park. The, the uh, reservoir there. Down in San Diego, we went to Balboa Park. Got shots like this one. This is a channel swap. Um, blue sky effect, white foliage. Same thing here. The sculptures, the statues in, the, um, in Balboa Park, San Diego. And a little IR chrome with some sun flare just thrown in for good measure. You get those a lens bursts, which are kind of cool. So to do that, I stopped way down. Used a wide-angle lens. And then recently, I went to South Dakota. I've been going to South Dakota every year, but I took a group there this past summer. You get shots like this in the Badlands. Totally cool with infrared, especially if you've got clouds. So I gave this one kind of a sepia treatment. Here's the church in the in the town of Interior. Get that white foliage. Had a really hazy day. We had some fires, wildfires burning one summer, and I went out with my infrared camera just driving around and came across this barn. I thought that was cool. This looks like it was taken in winter. This was actually captured in August, <laughs> so not not winter at all. And the cottonwood trees always make for for good shots out in the Badlands. Okay, the last topic, and I just want to touch on this because this is not a formal class. I do those separately, but I want to talk about just the fundamentals of how I process my images because there's lots of stuff out there. You can choose whatever you are most comfortable with, um, but I'm going to show you my basic um an overview of my basic infrared workflow. I use Lightroom. A lot of people don't like to use Lightroom for infrared, but I do. Um, it's not without its challenges. It requires that you really know a few things about how to use Lightroom, uh, specific specific stuff. It's not for people who are just you know click auto adjust and 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 be done with it. You've got to you've got to do this and make it work. Um, but I always use Lightroom anyway, right? Um, it's got the catalog. It's got some of the best image editing tools and some of the best masking tools that are available for any raw editor out there. So I'm very happy using it. Um, if I can stay out of Photoshop, I will. 
That's a general rule that I do with all of my processing. Um, you can generally get a little more color out of your infrared images than you would with your manufacturer's uh, converter as well. Um, like if I use my Nikon software to convert infrared images, I get almost monochrome images. There's just very little color in them. Um, I mentioned the masking tools and including now the new AI masks for things like selecting skies and subjects and people. And if you're already using Lightroom for everything else, why not just keep using it? I like to keep things simple. If I can use one editor, I'm going to use one editor. I shouldn't have to use two different, three different programs, depending on what kind of photo I'm working on that day. It just makes it easier for my brain to keep everything straight to use the same set of tools. That's the way I think about it, at least. Now, there are challenges with infrared and when you want to use Lightroom or ACR. Can wrong. The biggest challenge is that the Lightroom and ACR white balance slider doesn't go far enough to the left. It goes down about 2,000 Kelvin. It really needs to go down to about 1,000 Kelvin for you to properly white balance. As a result, when you bring your images in to Lightroom, no matter what you do, um, a lot of times they're just going to look pink and you really aren't able to set a white balance. The eyedropper is not going to work. It just doesn't have the range. Now, there is a solution to this, but it requires a little bit of under the hood tinkering. You create a custom calibration profile, a DCP file, with a white balance offset to just give it a correction factor using a tool that's available free called Adobe's DNG Profile Editor. Not hard to do, but you have to do it. And it's specific for every camera model. So if you have a, a white balance profile for your D700, and then you go out and you buy you know, a, a, a D850 or a Z6, you have to make a separate profile for each camera that includes this white balance offset. Otherwise, you're stuck, okay? So it's not hard, but it is a step that you have to do. Now that gets you some of the way. Um, what I have done is to add to this, I have then created a secondary profile in Lightroom. A lot of people don't even know that profiles exist in Lightroom. So I'm just told you about one. So I had the first thing is a fundamental camera specific profile. The second one is a unique camera raw profile that includes things like color balance and channel swapping information. It's a creative profile and it's not camera specific but it does need to refer back to an underlying camera specific profile with a particular name, which is what that first step was. So I've made two profiles here, okay? Um, I only actually choose one, the second one, because the second one is gonna automatically refer back to the first one as its underlying base profile. But you gotta do this, or, you know, but, but by doing this, I have some unique um, abilities to work in Lightroom. Not only can I set the white balance, which is what that first step would do, but I can put in my channel swapped file in the form of a lookup table or LUT in the XMP creative profile. I call this LUT-based infrared processing, if you will. So I can do this, and then I can do stuff like the channel swapping without going into Photoshop at all. Very cool. And by tweaking some other settings and creating a preset that I can just click the preset, say 720, I can have everything just immediately in a place where I can just start working on that image without having to fiddle with this every single time. Lightroom delivers more color and I can, I can get color balance from images with these saved presets from all my different wavelengths. So I have a preset for 590, I have a preset for 720, I have a preset for um, IR Chrome, depending on which filter I want to use. It makes it quick, intuitive, and easy once you've set it up. I think a lot of people do get hung up on the under the hood steps, but those are just there to set you up. And, and once they're there, you don't really have to worry about them anymore. So let me just show you some example images real quick. The image on the left, this is from um, San Diego. Um, or or um, no, that's... Uh, that's um, Tucson, I think. Anyway, um, where it is, it doesn't matter, but 
Arizona. On the left, that's what I would have gotten from my Z6 using the Nikon software, okay? There's a little bit of color there, but not much. But the white balance, you know, it's pretty neutral. On the right is what comes out of Lightroom. A lot more orange. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I can channel swap that and get those colors, even with a 720 uh, nanometer conversion, okay? So it's just a matter of how I choose to process the image. And from that base conversion, I can go in any direction I want. I can go color, I can go monochrome, I can do all kinds of fun things. So let me just show you what it looks like when you're in Lightroom. If I bring in this image into Lightroom and just by default, I use the Lightroom settings, Adobe color, okay? This is what you get. Ew, ugly, it's awful. It's orange, it's magenta, it's, it's terrible, okay? When I use my custom profile that includes not only the uh, base camera profile that I made to allow me to fix the white balance, but also color information, I get this. I can properly white balance the image. And then if I want to, because this profile that I made, this creative thing, includes the LUT that, that is basically the instructions for red blue channel swap if i change the amount slider here in lightroom on the profile i channel swap it so, and i can go you know in between settings too i don't have to it's not necessarily discrete steps so all one phase i can do all of this white balancing and channel swapping all in in Lightroom. That's the gist of it. So in, in total, I really like infrared photography and I really like using my full spectrum camera uh, with these filters. Um, it gives me a lot of creative um, potential, um, but I also have tried teaching this. And so not everybody always quite gets things. So like, if you're just starting out, stick with your black and white and if you're you know as you learn more you can get better with your processing and move into the the other realm so with that i want to thank everybody again for for coming and um in just a moment i'm going to open it up to questions <laughs>